which brings me to uh, Lifeboat. Uh, while reading the mission statement on uh, Lifeboat's website, I had a very intense uh, debate with some friends on one of the uh, things that were specified there. And that was the fact that a lifeboat is against the publication of the 1918th flu genoma on the internet. So, um, you know, there are many different uh, opinions about that. You know, some people say that, you know, everything, any kind of knowledge must be available to anybody because you can't trust. Uh, government, for example, with an information which is so uh, delicate. What's your opinion about that? Mm -hmm. um, freedom uh, is a very complex and delicate um, process. Uh, it is not an absolute reference uh, where uh, you can look at any society on in the world and point and say, "Oh, that society is is actually totally free." Um, as I look out um, from my window, I'm on the thirty-first floor of of, uh, of a building in in New York. I see other skyscrapers around, hundreds and hundreds of buildings. None of them has been built freely. All of them adhered to a building code. All of them have been built respecting the laws of physics, uh, the experience uh, and, and the rules of engineering. And the people who live within these buildings also uh, live their lives uh, within certain limits to their freedom. Um, information and and our capability of acting on information is precious as well. But many people are not fully equipped to understand what the consequences of misusing certain types of information uh, are. Um, others are, are better equipped and whether it is right and within what limits it is right for the second group to decide for the first is of course a fundamental question that we it, that we sh must keep asking ourselves in a democratic system um, there has been an example of a group of people who said if we go keep doing what we are doing things are going to be rather dangerous. Let's make sure that we find a way to collaborate so that those dangers are not realized. This group of people were uh, in the 60s and the early 70s the precursors of what you would call today the biotechnology researchers. And they met in California in what is now called the Asilomar Conference to design the protocols of building bio labs and conducting uh, experiments with dangerous uh, biological uh, specimens. And they were very, very successful in designing, adopting, and maintaining these best practices and these procedures because for the past 50 years, there haven't been global pandemics due to mistakes uh, or misuse of, of biotechnological materials. Um, 
the same kind of caution is now being applied on uh, self-replicating information systems. Biological systems are self-replicating proteins and, and DNA and RNA structures. AI systems are going to be very, very powerful. So the equivalent of the Azilomar conference is uh, something that has been organized two years ago in California again for researchers in the field of artificial intelligence to establish what are the protocols and what are the best practices to minimize the risk of dangerous consequences of, of these tools. Uh, so one topic on which um, there are very intense uh, debates, you know, among you know different visions of what freedom means and what uh, op open knowledge and uh, free knowledge means. Um, we have a couple of questions from uh, one of our um, readers. Um, there are very structured uh, questions uh, made by Roberto Favino. So, I will try to translate these as best as I can in English um, to, to, not, to render the, the idea they gave, they gave in Italian. So, in the most recent um, um, study, I'd say, on, of the hype cycle of emergent technologies, Gartner puts the Internet of Things in the first uh, phase, the one of technology triggers, even though uh, we've been talking about this for years. Is it because some technologies are still relatively recent or is something else missing to make the big step forward? Cultural factors, uh, the lack of an ecosystemic view of technologies and territory or something else? The Internet of Things has been uh, coming under different names for the past 30 years. Uh, there have been um, small isolated networks, um, attempts to standardize and adopt, uh, for example, systems of building automation for many, many, many years. The most recent interpretation of what the Internet of Things could become are totally dependent on pre-existing conditions that are just now becoming uh, uh, deployed widely enough. One of them is the internet itself. Unless there is a widespread, reliable, fast uh, network behind it, the things in the Internet of Things cannot collect their data. Another example is energy sources. Unless um, you can either radiate energy remotely or reliably collect solar energy or the power consumption of the small components of sensors is low enough so that a local battery can power it for a year or two and they are cheap enough so that they can be lost and replaced uh, without any problem once the battery is depleted. Uh, you can design all the thought experiments you want, but you won't uh, actually find useful deployments. The third issue, of course, is in the applications. Just as the killer app of personal computing was the word processor and the electronic spreadsheet, the Internet of Things has to find its killer app in order to explode. Uh, the location-based uh, technologies, for example, uh, that are a precursor of the Internet of Things, if you wish, because they uh, 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 use uh, the power of uh, uh, mobile phones and uh, uh, they can rely on people to spread them everywhere and they can rely on, on uh, uh, people to power them and so on and so forth. Uh, 
started to become more and more uh, popular. And these applications are a good example to experiment uh, very inexpensively because it is software that gets downloaded, installed and used by millions of people on what is going to be uh, the, the, the value going forward of these applications.